everyone, I'm Rosie. How is the end of the world going? So I'm 23 years late on this, but I decided to use all of this quarantine time to finally watch Revolutionary Girl Utena. Whew. So I decided to make a video about this show because it is great. I mean, it's nonsense, but it's great nonsense, and it's been a cornerstone of queer anime culture for more than two decades now, and everything from Steven Universe to She-Ra is full of Utena references, so it's probably worth talking about. A little bit of context. There is an anime director named Ikuhara. If you know him from anything, you probably know him from the really good seasons of Sailor Moon. You know, when the show was, like, the most gay. He also made a show called Yurikuma Arashi, which literally translates to lesbian bear storm and has toe biting in the opening, and another show called Sarazanmai that has kappas and very gay otters in it. That's Ikuhara. So he worked on Sailor Moon, and then in 1997, he and his art collective decided to make their own magical girl show where he could just go buck wild with the surrealism, and Utena is the result. Now, this video is just going to look at the TV show. There is a movie that is a whole experience, and I may just make a video about that movie next. We'll see. It's beautiful and strange. But the TV show is 39 episodes of weird, epic amazingness, and it really has a lot going on. So I'm going to get into a lot of spoilers for the show, and if that bothers you, go watch it. But also, there is nothing I can tell you about Utena that will make the viewing experience less mind-bendy. Utena has a reputation for being a weird show. That is accurate. It is a show that has themes it wants to explore, and it leans very, very heavily on the use of metaphor and symbolism to express those themes. It is surreal and absurd and beautiful. There is an episode where a character thinks they've laid an egg, and in another episode, that same character wears a cowbell and slowly transforms into a cow. The Nanami episodes are odd. But there's also a really nuanced and poignant exploration of girlhood and misogyny and queerness in the show, too. I don't know what happens at the end of the show. Like, literally? Like, what actually, not metaphorically, happens to the characters? There are aspects of backstory and plot that I don't understand. I'm not sure. I don't think Ikuhara knows either, honestly. It also doesn't matter. That's not the point. I understand what the show was trying to say, and that's the point. So my goal in this video is to break down some of the most important symbolism and talk about the themes of the show. Like, I can't tell you what the floating castle is, or like, why the whole Rose Bride duel thing exists, but I can tell you what it means. I think. What I think it means. Symbolism is everywhere in this show. Some of it is pretty obvious, like Anthe's rose garden being shaped like a birdcage symbolizes how she is trapped and treated like a possession, or Akio having that planetarium in his room which allows him to control and project a fake vision of the universe for others, because, you know, Akio is the worst. There's also the recurring segments of the Shadow Players who tell little parables that all connect to some idea that the episodes are about and highlight the way that stories use allegory. It's meta. Sometimes there's visual elements in the show that I'm not sure they are actually symbols for anything specific, but add to the overall unreality of the show. A lot of the things that happen when the student council meets are a good example of this. Uh, or repeated visual elements, like the spiral staircase sequence, which builds suspense and a feeling that these characters are being trapped in these cycling patterns of behavior again and again. The duelists are often manipulated into the duels and forced into these ultimately futile acts of violence, and we're always introduced to those scenes with that spiraling, unreal, Escher-like staircase. 
It builds a mood. The really big symbols in the show, though, are the ones focused on the idea of nobility. Princes and princesses and roses and all that. The show uses the fairy tale storybook idea of royalty to talk about, like, gender roles and presentation and the way that society at large tries to force people, particularly girls, into very specific roles and situations that are ultimately harmful for them. The main way all this is introduced is with the flashbacks to Utena's past. Utena, a princess, met a prince when she was a child shortly after her parents died, and though she doesn't remember why, this encounter makes her want to be a prince and also find her prince. That's like the conflict of the show in many ways, whether Utena will be or find a prince. She dresses in a boy's uniform, something she is berated by the school guidance counselor for on many occasions, and her desire to be a prince is what ultimately gets her wrapped up in the duels for Anthe. So Utena is already queering this idea of princes by wanting to be one. While her hair is long and pink and very feminine, her clothes and general attitude are more tomboyish. Utena's preoccupation with finding her prince is something that is used against her throughout the show. It allows Toga to cause her no end of trouble in season one because Utena thinks Toga might be her prince. The episode where he sends her that dress and invites her to the fancy party is a good example of this. And her desire to find her prince ultimately allows Akio to manipulate her and, like, exploit her in the final arc. Akio is her prince from her memory, and because he is her prince, he, an adult man, is able to seduce Utena and use her for his own goals. Because he is the worst, and we should call the police. And, uh, and here is where metaphor supersedes the plot, right? Because we find out that the prince that saved Utena from grief when she's in the rose coffin was Akio, or maybe Dios. Like, okay, Akio is Dios. Dios, which means God, by the way, was a true prince, I guess. And Akio, who, as he explains in the show, his name literally translates to Morning Star like the devil. Akio is the corrupted version of Dios because gender roles are unattainable and unrealistic for men too, I guess. Um, Anthe saved Dios, her brother, in some undefined way, and as a result, she is suffering. She's being abused a lot. Sometimes, like, literally, like, sexually abused, and sometimes with, like, a lot of swords, uh, in maybe a mostly metaphorical way. Anthe has become the Rose Bride because she can't be a true princess, which makes her a witch. What any of that literally means for these characters isn't the point. Like, how Anthe saved her brother and why this corrupted him and how that caused Anthe to suffer isn't explained beyond just, like, the prince and witch metaphor, it doesn't matter. Just follow the symbolism. So, Anthe is suffering because she's a witch, not a princess, and she needs a true prince to save her, which Akio can't do, or won't do. Utena, when she is young and discovers this in a flashback, vows to become a prince specifically to help Anthe. It is her desire to save Anthe that gets Utena out of the rose coffin, okay? However, Utena's quest to find the prince opens her up to being abused and used by Akio, distracting her from her goal to save Anthe. So we have this whole conversation about how these fairy tale roles are harmful. In the climax, Akio turns Utena into a princess, like dress and crown and all. He's the prince, she's the princess, he's going to take on the power of revolution for himself, and Anthe gets impaled by like a shit ton of swords because the cycle of violence and abuse and suffering caused by these fairy tale roles is continuing. But it doesn't work. Akio can't open the final door. He doesn't really care. He says he'll just find more duelists and keep the cycle going. And then, like, that scene happens, y'all. Utena, in so much pain, rejects Akio, literally shoves him aside, and says that she will be the prince for Anthe, and she opens the door, and the door is the rose coffin that she was in when she was a kid, and Anthe is inside, because the rose coffin symbolizes despair, right? And Utena got out of the coffin to save Anthe, and now Anthe is in despair, and Utena goes to her, and they, they reach for each other, and their hands touch? And look, again, I can't, I can't tell you what literally happens to the characters here. It's like 90% percent 
visual metaphor, and I'm pretty sure that the entire academy isn't even, like, a real space and is, like, some kind of pocket universe. But Anthe falls, and then the scene cuts, and Utena is gone. Like, she's not at the school anymore, and you think Utena failed. But then, Anthe tells Akio she is leaving. Away from the planetarium, with its fake little universe under Akio's control, and away from the greenhouse, shaped like a cage, and out of the gates, Anthe leaves, and she's going to find Utena. The world has changed. The world has been revolutionized, and Anthe is free. <sighs> Ladies, sometimes you just symbolically explore the way society tries to force girls into misogynistic and heteronormative expectations with flowery fairy tales and toxic predatory men, and only through our relationships with other women can we break free and find self-actualization and independence to dismantle patriarchy, right? Only through our love for other girls can we revolutionize the world. So, yeah. Utena is about the ways that gender roles can trap and harm women, and how predatory men will use those gender roles to manipulate and abuse women, and how queerness in both our gender presentation and relationships can free us from that. That's the show. I still don't know why Nanami thought she laid an egg, but the episode was weird. <sighs> so yes, thank you for watching. I still have so many thoughts about Utena in my brain. I might make a video next about the car scene from the movie. I don't know. I'm processing it. But, um, yeah. Thanks to all my supporters on Patreon who have been very patient during this last hiatus of mine. And if you liked listening to this queer millennial feminist rant about stuff for a while, do all the YouTube stuff. Uh, down in the comments, talk about Utena, I guess. What do y'all think it means? What symbolism do you still not understand from the show? Let me know. We'll chat about it. <laughs>